much for joining us. This is Unlock You with Dr. Shannon Crawford. I'm a clinical psychologist, leadership consultant, and a really big fan of you getting to fulfill your life purpose. I want you to get unstuck and unlock your potential relationally, emotionally, spiritually, and vocationally. Thanks for joining us and let's get started. Welcome to Unlock You with Dr. Shannon Crawford. And today I have the extravagant privilege of being with Alan and Stephanie Kelsey. They are heroes in my life and I love strength-based everything. Positivity is in my top five. And so I use it a lot in therapy and in my own personal life and relationships. And I've been using their curriculum quite a bit with a lot of my clients that I've been seeing in their relationships. So I've followed strength, strengths based curriculum for a long time, but they wrote the book on marriage. So in a world where everybody is pointing out the flaws of the other person, I think it's a breath of fresh air to have a couple who has been leading in all these spheres to take the time, share some of their own story and equip you with relevant insights of how your strengths may be clashing, but could be complimenting if you understood them. And they have a book that I would encourage you to pause if you can, not unless you're driving, don't do that. But strengthsmarriage.com, you can get their book probably on Amazon as well and bookstores, uh, but it's strength-based marriage. And so taking all the principles we love from corporate American positivity and positive psychology, and now fine tuning it, honing it more to our intimate relationships and how that plays out in our everyday lives. So I want to thank Stephanie and Alan for being with us as our guest today. Thanks for having us. We're excited to be here. Yeah, with you. thanks, Shannon. It's great to spend time with you. Oh, thank you. It's a privilege for me. So I know that you have been, I've had them speak before for other events, but I know you've shared some of your own story. How did this become a journey that you walked on and said yes to in writing this book? Well, I think I got in, I invited to um, a trip where four of us guys were going to do some kind of a wild at heart retreat thing. And my job was to facilitate the dialogue. I had the hard work of the, of the four of us. Um, and what I determined was a place of greatest interest to me was the intersection of all of the, the embodiments, all of the investment, all the gifts that God puts in each of us uniquely that as one line and where that intersects with if you're comfortable with the idea of destiny mm -hmm. that where those two things overlap there's a space there where those two lines overlap and i just thought man there's so much meat on that bone i i have to digest this and, and i ended up going on this trip with guys that and people that work for gallup and so we spent three or four days talking about that and when i was done with that trip i was just wrecked my curiosity was at an insane level for pursuing more and understanding more about how this space works and what God's doing there and what opportunities lie there and how does men and women show up in this space and how do they behave? Do they help each other? Do they hurt each other? What does that look like? So here I am 20 years later, uh, all the wiser for my journey and still hot in pursuit of what God shows me in that space. I love it. And how has this impacted your marriage, understanding that there's different strengths that we both bring to the relationship? Well, I, I first just want to acknowledge that marriage is very hard. Hmm. It is very hard. And there you're bringing two lives that are from completely different upbringings and mindsets together. And I think, you know, we've seen the more people that we have talked to over the years that it's very common to attract what you don't have. Mm -hmm. You're enamored by the gifts in somebody else because you see a strength, you see an ability in them that you're wowed by because it's different than you. And that's where, you know, you always hear about the rose colored glasses when you first like start dating or the honeymoon stage. And then you just start realizing how extremely different we are and how frustrating that could be 
because you don't think like I do, which means you're broken, right? Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with you. (laughs) Yes. So I think um, living out like a committed relationship because we both really love the Lord, but yet seeing each other as like strange aliens living in our home together is a huge, is a great place and a great foundation, like Alan said, for his curiosity that was already sparked through these strengths conversations to easily start transferring that into marriage. And how is it that that applies to marriage? So you can take it from there. (laughs) (laughs) Shannon, you probably deal with this quite a bit, but, you know, especially in Christianity, I think there's a sense where, um, you know, if I can just lose myself completely and the two of us can become one, Mm -hmm. you know, in some very weird existential kind of way, uh, that we have reached sort of marriage nirvana in some way. Mm -hmm. And, the truth is probably furthest from that. You know, it's it's really it's the opposite idea. I I I lose interest in that I completely understand mm. uh, because now there's nothing left to understand. I, I've got it, and so I, I want to move on to the next thing to learn. We are inherently a learning people, um, and and so I love that there's a mystery associated with marriage. But I think that God gives us just enough insight into how each other are built and why we're both exceptional uh, that it can keep us sort of lured and invited by the other to discover that mystery, to understand what's unique about each person. And really, it's the coming together of these very powerful, unique, strongly different people that make the agreement to do life together as opposed to one losing themselves in the other. Mm -hmm. Uh, that I think represents a healthy marriage. Yeah. So we might use the word enmeshment that a lot of times we think if I just become less of me and I don't have as many preferences or strengths, then somehow we will become homeostasis balance. Everything will be kumbaya, but quite the opposite. It can become roommates. It can be a very dead relationship if I'm not bringing all of me to the table. And what would you say to somebody who thought they needed to be small and they needed to just serve and only just show up this very meek way while not going to the other extreme of pride, but just showing up authentically and allowing our strengths to be vibrant and accessible in the marriage. Yeah. I would say my path, my path for suggested healing would be to try to understand how it is that you came to that perspective. Mm -hmm. Some examples like you might think that because it's what your mother modeled for you. Mm-hmm. That's how that's how either husbands or wives show up in that marriage. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you have the, the talent or the strength of you of um, oh gosh, harmony. Mm-hmm. And if you have harmony, you have this innate desire to want to make room for the for others. And so it might actually almost feel uh, good in some way to lose yourself in a moment. And, and the more of it that happens, the more demand that's placed on you to make room for somebody else, the almost the better you feel. Mm-hmm. That can check a, check a strengths box, but it diminishes you as an individual in the marriage. So I want you to understand how it is that you came to this understanding. Mm-hmm. Because whatever the path was that got you there is the path you need to go down to unwind it. So if it's if it's rooted in the way your folks taught you, then, okay, we've got to get some new thinking going there. And that's one path. But if you're, if you're doing this motivated in some fashion by a misunderstanding of your strength, then that's a different set of conversations we need to have. And yet it's still going to sell, sit, end up in the same solution. solution. So as you're listening to this audience, I hope that you've taken the time to even identify what are my strengths and to start appreciating them. A lot of us uh, get really frustrated. So we've gotten feedback that maybe we're too dominant or we're too strategic or we're too in our head or we're too emotional or we're too feeling. Whatever the feedback we've gotten, 
like he's saying that we can have a core belief and a judgment against our own strength or overly relying in a strength. So the other opposite where I've so relied on my harmony or my um, decisiveness, whatever that strength might be. Um, and then I'm not creating space for other parts of my own personality, much less the other person's personality to show up because maybe there's an element of control or a lie I've believed. And now I'm still running at an uncomfortable conscious level based on that automaticity of where that belief came from. And I'm replicating things that I may not even like, but I don't know how I'm hooking other people into that dynamic. How have you guys seen examples either in your own life or other people that might help us resonate with like, oh gosh, I think I have seen that. Well, I think sometimes religion can help play into um, a stereotype that, you know, the man is the leader and he's in charge and the, the woman could easily minimize herself and her calling in her life, um, feel pigeonholed into being a mom and a wife and not really identifying with a lot of other things or maybe even feel guilty if she does mm -hmm. if she does go out to the workforce and there may be a guilt on her so I think you know religion can play a part of that if it's not a healthy perspective mm -hmm. that we're submitting to one another that when you don't fully show up in your marriage that you are you're allowing that lack of contribution to not make you as strong as you could be as a couple yeah. and that submission does ha doesn't have anything to do with not having a voice mm -hmm. so it could just be a misconception of the word of god that causes like a minimization um or an over like you said a dominant personality even to have a self-awareness if you have very dominant strengths and you learn about them and you learn that it can be easy for other people to set themselves aside because you show up so strong mm -hmm. for you to be healthy it's good for you to learn how to invite other people into conversations and recognize that you are better mm -hmm. or even how do you how do you show up in spaces are people afraid to speak up mm -hmm. like if you'll ask people around you some really great questions you can learn how to show up in a way that you're making space for other people and know that that makes you a stronger better person as well i feel like um one really practical example that i have liked to share when we've spoken around this subject is my idea as a Christian wife and what that looked like in our relationship and our family for my husband to lead me, I pushed him away from wanting to what he should. And he he's very intellectual, my husband is. And so in as Alan would spend time with God, it he loves having his hands busy when he's spending time with God. He loves having places that are um, peaceful to him. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that's in the garage when he's tinkering on a car. Sometimes that's in the pool where he's swimming and there's no other sounds around him. It's just him in the water talking with the Lord. And I had, I had a, probably a well-meaning description sent to me that this is what a godly husband looks like. And that's not what I was experiencing with my husband, even though he's a very godly man. And so without um, meaning or wanting or realizing what I was doing, mm -hmm. I was putting on him a pressure to show up in his relationship with God to me and in our marriage in a way that was not natural for him. Mm -hmm. And it pushed him further away from wanting to enter into that place instead of it encouraging him. <laughs> so that's maybe a really practical example 
Yes. And I hear that a lot, actually, on both sides. Husbands who are trying to get their wives to be more whatever pigeonhole they have an expectation. And wives definitely do that, where there's a little bit of micromanaging and manipulation in good intentions, not intentional, yeah. Um, yeah. but trying to just kind of get this person to fit in maybe the fantasy or idealization, the representation of what I thought it was supposed to look like. And when things don't match up to our expectation or our fantasy, and I use the word fantasy, not as like I'm lusting after something, but it's just what the brain creates as the ideal standard. And then when life doesn't match that, then many times we feel anxiety and my anxiety drives me toward control. And so yeah. I try to manage the other person instead of back to Alan's prior word, curiosity of wanting to find out more about them and see how it, um, it flows out of an authentic experience versus a mindset that I've created and a template that I'm now comparing this person to artificially. So have you guys ever experienced anything where you tried to, if you feel comfortable, you don't have to, um, but maybe try to fit each other into molds based on an expectation. I know Stephanie, you just shared a great illustration. Yeah. yeah. No, but I do think, I do think it raises an interesting statement for me though, about, about the way that we, you know, if you just, the way that we hear from God, mm. you know, that so much of this is relational, Shannon. I mean, marriage obviously is incredibly relational, but our relationship with the Father also is relational. And, and being the master creator, he built us in a particular way. And I think that there's so much to be learned if we can go open-handedly to him and, and sort of with respect say, okay, you did this to me. So what did you have in mind here? You know, and just take one strength at a time, pose the question and wait to give him an opportunity to respond and see what he has to say. Or or lead the witness a little bit and say, you know, what do you love about this strength and the way that I show up with it? Yeah. And it will surprise you what he brings to you as a reminder of a moment that he saw in your life uh, when you used that strength in a particular way. And, and, and so this idea of curiosity that leads you to learn more about yourself at the hands of the one who gave it to you in the first place. I just love this picture. I love this idea. But it leads me to another idea, which is, which is that I believe that my ability to just hear from my wife um, is most open and strong when I feel not threatened, when I feel strong, when I feel at ease, when I feel completely myself, when all of me need to show up. Um, and, and so relatedly, I think that that is a way for us to be able to feel heard if one person is feeling diminished or feeling insecure or not feeling strong, it's going to be harder for that person to really hear what the other has to say. Yeah. And in my relationship with God, if I feel diminished or I'm not feeling strong, I'm, I, it's harder for me to hear. And so a path to hearing the Lord clearer mm -hmm. is to go out and deploy your strengths in, in some you know, good sort of way. And, and then just be conscious that the Lord might be speaking to you. And I think it's a, I think it's a wide open space for us to tighten our relationships with our creator. Absolutely. And I would yeah. love, even if somebody's listening and you don't have a relationship with God, that that would still be a good question to ask. So mm. let's say there's a creator for argument's sake. And what if there is somebody who is going to give you a thought or a feeling? It's probably not Charlton Heston in your head with booming voice, <laughs> but it's probably more just a, an impression or a thought, a feeling, a sensation. Something might just pop up. And we want you to enjoy your strengths, enjoy who you are, because you have so much to offer. And when we start the conversation with judgment, whether it's judgment against my own strengths, my own personality, or judgment against the other person's strength or personality, immediately what you're doing is you're activating the back of the brain because the amygdala goes, it's not safe. Mm 
I need to either control or manage you or me in order for things to calm down. And what happens is I'm not playful. I'm not creative. I'm not thinking of long-term consequences. I'm just trying to feel better right now and make this situation stop because it's not okay. And so when we switch, and if somebody's listening today and you found yourself saying, man, if I could just get my spouse to fix this about their personality, or if they would just stop doing this, you've already formed a judgment. So that means the next time that person does it, there's going to be like a bristling on the inside of you that they can feel whether you say anything or not, that reaction will produce shame. And then there's an unconscious power struggle where human nature is usually going to bow up and they're going to do it more because there's this part of me that doesn't want to be suppressed and controlled or the inverse where kind of put their tail between their legs and they stop doing that. But then you stop getting all the other good parts of their personality because shame takes over. And then I'm just playing small to appease you because I can see the dislike and discomfort when I show that side of my personality. And then that makes people very vulnerable to going outside of the relationship for that part of the personality to be expressed and feel known when people don't feel known in their marriage relationship anymore because I haven't been creating space where that part of the personality can show up with Mm -hmm. curiosity, with playfulness, with interest. And now I'm going to caution myself because it doesn't mean like I've had extreme cases where let's say the guy wants her to look like a prostitute in order for them to be intimate. I'm not talking about extreme fantasy fetish, weird stuff, domineering stuff. I'm talking about just the healthy, normal range of personality. And if somebody likes guns and shooting and being aggressive, that the other person isn't like shutting that down because of their own discomfort with whatever their background with those things are. Or if somebody is more artistic and feeling, and that doesn't make sense to the logical one, whatever that contrast might be, if we can switch it. And I just, it, the word keeps standing out to me. If we could switch from judgment to curiosity, because curiosity is the front of the brain. That's a leaning forward and a leaning toward instead of a leaning against. And when I feel like somebody's interested in me and they're curious, I'm more likely to sparkle and shine and classical conditioning. I'm going to associate you person who's making me feel interesting. And now I'm going to have all these happy chemicals every time I see you. And there's going to be an association that all these parts of my personality get to be enjoyed instead of analyzed, critiqued and made to feel like wrong and picked apart. And I have to explain myself instead of just being enjoyed and delighted in. When we go back to curiosity, you're engaging prefrontal cortex. And again, that's more of a present and future oriented region of the brain. And that creates a legacy mindset versus an immediacy and a control of the present mindset. So when we're working with couples, whether it's ourselves or other people, it's really easy to form judgments of something being right or wrong. And what would you guys say if you were working with a couple who's just kind of stuck in this fixation of if they would just fix this, all of our problems would go away? Well, I, I will, with your question, kind of throw maybe uh-huh. an example that a lot of people can relate to. And uh, in our strengths, my top strengths all lend towards relationships. And in Alan's top strengths, they lend much more to like learning and intellectual and strategic and things that are greatly celebrated, like in the CEO world. (laughs) And so when we show up in any space, it can, if we're not coming with a love and a curiosity for even watching each other in that space with awe of how different we may navigate any, any place that we are, that it can become that we're against, we're against one another. We're not for one another. Yeah. And how this looks practically in our life at times is that um, going to our girls' volleyball games, I have been cultivating relationships with the parents on the team. And I see this as a place to witness and share, people, share with people about my love for God. 
And uh, I try to do that gently and carefully and not in their face, but just by being friendly and all of those things. And Alan comes to a game and he's in his head that this is, I am here to watch my daughter play. I am not here to make friends with anybody. I am not here to <laughs> bring myself to this place in a way that I'm worried or I care about or needing to have conversation. He's very like focused is one of his top five as well. His focus is to be there and to watch my daughter play. And that's what I'm doing. So I would feel almost hurt. Mm -hmm that I'm, I'm on another mission. I am there to watch my daughter play, but I'm also wanting to care and love these other people sitting around us. Mm -hmm. And that's just not his goal at all. And so in just gen in general, in social settings, we have had to learn that if I, if we're invited to a party I, uh, I like deep relationships, not lots of surfacey relationships. So if I'm at a party and I really connect with somebody, I may get in a conversation and want to stay there till midnight. Mm -hmm. There's no way Alan's going to get in any conversation with anybody and stay there till midnight. He's going to be looking, giving me the look across the room. Like, can we leave now? Mm -hmm. Can we go? Is it time? Have you had enough time? Like, <laughs> come on. No, I'll, I'll see you and I'll raise you one. I not oh. only feel that I will begin the strategy of planning for our exit before we even before get there. Before we get there. Because I know it's going to take a few rounds of, the, of negotiation before we pick a time. And it drives me nuts because I'm like, I don't know who I'm going to meet. I don't know if I'm going to have a great conversation that I want to stay there for because everything's firing on the inside of me with excitement about this conversation <laughs> or I may go and I don't really hit one of those conversations and I am ready to leave earlier not before cake I, if it's a party there's usually cake, <laughs> Probably, have cake. Yeah, <laughs> so you can see again how opposite or how our strengths lend in our personality in a way that it affects like everywhere we are showing up and everything we are doing. And we really, again, you can have these idealistic ways of looking at marriage that you're together all the time. You do everything together. Well, we, to fix this, we started driving separate to the same place. Problem solving. I love it. <laughs> so if I'm at a volleyball game and I get caught up in a conversation, with one of one of the other parents there, he can head home. Mm -hmm. food's another thing that drives him in a different way than it does me if he's hungry you better let him go <laughs> that man needs to get food in his body <laughs> so so anyhow those are some really practical ways that yeah. you, how easy you can be against one another mm -hmm. because it feels so foreign and so weird to me that you would not care about these people that are around us and you just want to get to bed at a certain time regardless of what conversations are happening <laughs> Those are ways that we have had to kind of look at our strengths seeing our strengths in black and white was so helpful for us because without the the words the verbiage to put behind what we're doing their actions are it can literally feel like the person's just doing that to annoy you mm -hmm. and then when you realize oh this is like hardwired in them they've been operating this way since they were born because this makes sense to them it's mm -hmm. like imprinted within them then you can kind of take out the personal part that kind of gets us all in a tough mm -hmm. and we can realize like, oh, okay, like he's not doing this just to annoy me. He actually thinks and functions this way and it makes sense to him and the other way around. Like I'm not trying to be so relational and 
spend time too long talking to people or you know those kinds of things it's just a part of who i am people can come up that don't even know me and like sense in me an approachableness mm. and have conversations with me in the grocery store or anywhere where they're sharing things that are probably more private than you would think <laughs> that you would ever share with somebody but that happens to me on a regular basis but it's just a part of who i am and the world sees it. The world sees the way that you are showing up when you're able to live out your strengths and who you are in, in the, in, I don't want to say too loud of a way, but a loud way, like you're fully present with who you are and you're confident in that. It's a really beautiful thing and it does draw people to you. Yeah, so it's just a part of the way I am that I must be the one to pack the car if we're going to go on oh vacation. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, because there's your way and then there's the right way. So if you just let me take care of it, then I'm going to I'm gonna get up. It's just all going to be good. I'm going to set it up in such a way that the right bags come out first. If there's a moment in our trip where somebody's going to need something, that thing's going to be on the top, not in the bottom. I'm thinking about all those things ahead of time. That's why I need to, yeah. I need to put it like that. So the way. miracle is that if I'm going on a trip with the girls in the car, which mm -hmm. our girls are out of the house now, when they were it. younger, <laughs> somehow we still got packed and got there yeah. just fine. No. So Alan has strategic like in his top five. I have strategic like at number 10 or 11. And so it's not that I am not strategic. So don't even, don't start with me. But it's so high on his. I truly have learned to step aside because if there's two people trying to strategically pack a car that think very different mm -hmm. you may kill each other before you get to where you're going exactly and that's not a good thing no. <laughs> it's really hard to start a great vacation on that kind of stuff yes <laughs> so knowing it's higher on his on his um strengths barometer mm -hmm. I, that's something i can easily just okay let it go if Alan is present and I am present at the same time and we're packing, Alan can pack the car. I'll just put the bags all next to the car. You can you can figure that out and that will make you happy. Shannon, I will say, <laughs> I have done quite a bit of traveling in my life and I will say unrelated to packing the car because that's clear, I should do that. But <laughs> I hate packing a suitcase. I literally, it's the worst thing. I will defer, I will wait, I will push it off. It gets to be the last minute. And the reason for it is because of the indecisiveness. I'm so strategic. It's like, well, what if this? Well, then what if that? But I don't have that much room, so I have to put less in. But then I really need more. And it's the in and out of the process is exhausting. What if it's cold? What if it's hot? Oh, I hate it. <laughs> strategic is in my top five, too. So you just explained myself to me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you said something a minute ago that really uh, piqued my interest. And I want to, if we have time. I'd yep. love to go back to it a little bit. And you made mention of this idea that how, you know, couples will deem a thing right or wrong mm -hmm. based on their ability to understand it, know the, the motivation for the person. Why did you do it that way? Why did you show up that way? We call those things right and wrong, right? And um, something I've come to discover lately that I'm really appreciating is, is if I could do raising our kids over again, mm -hmm. I would take as much of the word right and wrong out of our vocabulary mm -hmm. and reserve it really for things that are maybe immoral, illegal, or unethical or something like that. And then take, so those, okay, I'll give you right and wrong because it's sort of a legal statement. You are either in compliance or out of compliance of some regulations, right? So I'll, I'll let those live, but the rest, I, I wanna just call that learning. Mm -hmm. because it makes so much room for, for us to go on a journey of discovery with our kids to figure out what the problem is that they're trying to solve. Now, the upside is 
you you foster the curiosity in the kid and there's just nothing wrong with that right the downside though is it is going to cost you an extra minute and if you don't have it that approach is going to be hard to do but um it does make room for people to show up with their strengths yeah it, it, it creates an environment where we are more welcoming of diversity and strength in some fashion that maybe the rest of the families never have seen or understood before. Yeah, that's huge. Just changing the approach would get a totally different response and then help them learn into their strength versus kind of feeling like I'm bad and then shame takes it unconscious. I may get outward compliance in the moment and the control may be restored for the moment, but then usually people are going to act out with that. Whatever goes down and unconscious is going to come out in some way leaking. And so how many times as parents or in a relationship or even with ourselves that we try to bury something, control it, analyze it, say right or wrong, but barring moral things, but just yeah. about our personality specifically. And then it actually becomes a stronger impulse later. Uh, we see that a lot of times with addictions and even emotional affairs where people are trying so hard to suppress and bury because they've decided that's right or wrong. And then now it's coming out in like opposite equal reaction. As much as I push something down, as much as it will later come out as an impulse. And because it's coming from the unconscious, then it's not mediated by the conscious mind, the decision that I'm making during that reckless kind of free for all letting go of that impulse. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think at the root of strengths, there's this idea of, in a qualified way, truly being able to celebrate the people that are around you and recognize the one of a kind uniqueness of literally everybody on the planet. Uh, you know, our world is in this crazy cancel culture and a hundred other things you want to identify right now. And it's really hard in the middle of all of that no saying uh, to find any place that celebrates who you are kind of the way God made you yeah. and, and make room for that to show up in a way that feels welcome and good. Mm -hmm. now, now, if I'm using my strength, like we mentioned earlier, like I have the strength of strategic Here's the, here's the cautionary side of, of every strength. I, I can use my strategy to develop really helpful plans on how a business can grow and, and improve. But I could also use my strategy on how to plan how never to be caught by the police if I wanted to rob your house. Which he does not want to do that. <laughs> just kidding. No, I don't want to do that. does not endorse that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but there's a way for me to get just as much sort of sure. being shot from using my ability right. because it doesn't have a moral compass. My dopamine shot doesn't care. It's just like, hey, give me the shot. That's all mm -hmm. I want. I don't care if it comes from doing something moral or illegal. Come on. So that's why there's, there's, um, um, there's a, a responsibility that comes with possessing this much power mm -hmm. um, and, and we ought to deploy it well. You know, a case could be made that perhaps two fantastic orators, let's, let's call them uh, Billy Graham or, or Adolf Hitler, right? Mm -hmm. Unbelievably powerful people movers with their voices, right? Amazing communicators. One took all that power and drove it through a really healthy kind of interface and got this amplified goodness on the other side and the other took the same power and drove it through more of a broken filter and got this really destructive result on the other side yeah. so there's a there's a, a a responsibility and onus that rests with each of us as we carry around this god-sized ability to deploy it in a fashion that's not just good for us but good for the people around us too absolutely because an unrefined gift can be an assault rifle in the wrong hands that you can argue your way and win every, you know, intellectual debate, but yet you're actually smashing other people and using what is a natural strength of being a communicator, for instance, um, yeah. and using it to manipulate and get people into uh, mind traps and they do what you want, but at the cost of really using your gift to hurt and wound instead of edify and encourage. Oh yeah. I was counseling a couple, uh, a couple years ago, and this was exactly the case in their mm -hmm. marriage. He was winning each battle because 
intellectually and argumentatively, he had an advanced experience skill set, and he was just he would just wipe the floor with her on every on every turn, and he went clearly. I mean, there's, yeah. there, you know, there was no comeback from her that was undoing or standing toe to toe with where he was, mm -hmm. and uh, and I caught, you know, got opportunity to, to connect with him individually, and you know, let's call him Jack. That wasn't his name, but you know, I said, Jack, you're going to win these battles, and you're going to feel justified in it, but you're going to lose the war, my friend, and you have to decide mm -hmm. where you want to be on this deal. And that was that was a shocker for him, and he and uh, there was a turning point. It, it didn't change fast, but it did come. It did come around, and he had to learn. You know, hey, I, just because I can doesn't mean I should. That's good. Tremendous responsibility with this giftedness that we have. That reminds me of another example of working with a couple that he had very strong positivity. So when his wife would come to him with heartaches and issues, mm -hmm. he would spin it positive and she would be left in this emotional place of not feeling seen or heard or understood or that her emotions mattered. And, um, you know, they had multiple children that were small and in those seasons you know you need to be heard in a really different way even because mm -hmm. the amount of change happening in your life as a mom and being at home and your identity kind of being just consumed by these little people and you don't feel like yourself so all of these things are going on inside of her and she would just get a pep talk and it not being really addressed that she was drowning and needing help. Yeah. And so again, you can see with your strengths, we'll, we will, we'll quickly go to what our st top strengths are to manage any situation. Yeah. And if we're not careful in that managing, we totally are missing the person right in front of us. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. You know, one, you still there? Good. Yeah. One of the ways that I, uh, I, I, one of the motivations I had for writing uh, the material is because, you know, it, it does apply to strengths, but it starts with an individual because a healthy marriage is made up of two very, you know, strong and, and submitted to each other kind of individuals. And if, and if you can't think about yourself in a healthy and balanced kind of way, then it's unlikely that you're going to show up in a balanced way to your partner or to your spouse. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason I felt that way is because, man, I just saw so often uh, in people the willingness or the readiness to tear ourselves down and to diminish our own contribution and to try to show up lesser than really what's potentially inside. Yeah. And I wanted to permission that I wanted to permission the the curiosity and the creativity and the strength that lies there, make room for it, and, and not just in an existential way, but in a really simple, practical kind of way. And I just haven't found another tool that's better mm -hmm. than the Strengths Finder sort of tool, I think, than to give us the language that really enables that. It's very invitational. Mm hmm. It's just so accessible to have language to say, oh, that's why I do that. Myers-Briggs does it. There's lots of resources out there, but I think strengths does it in a way that's just so tidy and the language and the description of each one, I'll go through it with a couple. And it's like longstanding irritations. Like you're just doing that to annoy me. Many of those judgments and beliefs have been percolating for a long time until now we have language and it's in front of us in black and white, looking at the results going, oh, that's literally just a difference in our personality. And like you've talked about, now we know, okay, Alan does the, um, he does the packing and then Stephanie may take her own car if it might be a little bit more relational and you find the right rhythm and you create space and margin for that. Again, taking it out of the illusion of what it was supposed to look like in my template of my brain and now going into how do I lean in and organically show up in a way that's healthy for me and for them and then how 
have that learning and that curiosity, that space where, oh, okay, trial and error. It didn't work out this way. Why not? And then just kind of have like a board meeting where we can visit about that and discuss what, what's my strength and how do I make room for that for you and for me? And if you can have language around that and then carved out time. So back to your point earlier, you made a great point of if you're parenting, it would be great if, but if you don't have the time, it's pretty hard. That's a hard reach. And for many couples, just the basic principle of having a check-in time, almost like if you were a business and you just need to know where are we at? What are we doing? How are we doing on that? But not just with finances, not just with the logistics of being co-responsible people for this house and kids, but for actual, like, how is my heart? How is yours? Are we missing anywhere? Is there something that I could do to serve you and bring something out in you? Am I squashing you in any way? Am I leaning back and minimizing myself in any way? Having that conversation based on research as a one uh, one time a week conversation separate from chores and to-do lists and sleepy and hungry and people pulling at you. But if people just create that conversation, there is so many more obstacles, fights, everyday issues and I don't have to research, but I've seen it antidotally, it reduces the likelihood of emotional affairs because all the stuff I'm griping about on the inside is going to the right person and we're having that conversation versus I gripe about it, but we're too busy. We're looking at the clock. We've got the next thing to do. And then when I do unload, it's usually to the wrong person if I'm not being intentional to take it to my significant other. So as people are listening to this episode, what are a couple last minute things that you would say if you were just sitting with a couple who's trying to figure out each of their strengths? Yeah, if you want to be a strengths wizard, then you'll have to follow Shannon's blog and make sure you do what he <laughs> tells you to do. I didn't but, pay him to say that. <laughs> but if you don't have as much time, <laughs> perhaps what you could do is just with one strength mm. from your spouse, find out what that is. And sit down from them and and ask them to explain to you how that strength shows up in their lives. Mm -hmm. So they're going to tell you, I'm going to tell you from my perspective, here's my strength. I have this. And, and, you know, at home, this is what it gives me energy when I'm at work. This is what I love to do. I use it this way when I'm working with the kids. Then if you want to get extra credit, if you really want to get the extra points, then as the listener, wait until they're done, ask if there's anything else. And then based on what they've told you, begin then to tell on them how you see them. Do the thing they just said they were doing, that they love to do. Hmm. Uh, you know, my, my beautiful bride and, and, and the times that we've spent in social settings, maybe at a church service or something, and I have seen her kind of, drifting to a place where there's groups of people and maybe a little bit of need showing up and just the winsome smile on her face and the interaction with other people that just feels so casual and so inviting. And I watched the temperature of that entire gathering change and evolve and everybody leaves satisfied. And she just walks away like it was no big deal. And it would have been an all day affair if I was trying to help those folks. I mean, I just could not have pulled it off on my best day. But she just makes it look like such light work. Well, if I see that, then it's so helpful for me to point out to her, I saw what you did last summer. Okay, no, that's just a bad movie. <laughs> what I really okay. mean was, I, I saw what you did. I, I, you, you should see what you look like when you do that. It's always so great when you do that. And yeah. we need more of that. Our family needs it. Yeah. So if you, can, if you can hear from the other person how their strengths show up and then tell them that say, oh, I saw you do this. Oh, I saw you do that. There's a few things going on here. One is you're learning about how your spouse is wired, but then your spouse is learning that you actually pay better attention than she thinks or he thinks. You're seeing things at a deeper level than what maybe they're giving you credit for, and it moves things in your relationship. It's really helpful. I think, too, just even as Alan sharing that example when you live in your own skin Mm -hmm. and you show up the way that you have just kind of evolved and learned, but with a rudimentary strength there that feels natural to you, 
it may be easier for your spouse to tell you the amazing things they see you do than you to say, because to me, you know, the example he just used of walking into a group of people and making a difference in their lives is something I don't think about doing. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing that on purpose. I would never give that as an example of how I use my strengths because it's not something I think about. It's just something I do. And so this, um, you know, this kind of activation that Alan is talking about what you're doing when you are talking about your spouse's strength to them, you are affirming to the core of who they are Mm -hmm. and you cannot feel more seen than talking about the core of what drives you, what excites you, what are you passionate about? What do you do that is so just second nature to you that other people are in awe of and you don't even know it. Mm -hmm. That speaks to the core of that person and you you will feel so loved and feel so seen and understood by your spouse to spend time talking about those things. Mm Absolutely. And if you just think per ratio, um, so if we give a lot more criticism and contempt and feedback about what people are doing wrong, how much like it would be sweet rivers, sweet living waters to have the same person that knows all your quirks and all your terribleness be the same person that's cheering you on and celebrating and recognizing, calling out the gold. And again, classical conditioning, I'm going to associate really good chemicals and I'm going to want to serve and do the things with this person versus if I'm only getting feedback about what I'm doing wrong, or we're just doing the business of life, then I don't really feel seen and known making people very vulnerable um, to making choices that aren't very good in a relationship because they don't feel seen and known. Mm -hmm. Mm. Good. I probably am oversimplifying and I'm doing this because I don't have near the fancy degrees that you do, Sam, but uh, it really does seem to me like all separations begin with, with starting to feel unseen, like yes. you just don't feel seen in this situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think we want to feel seen in a celebrated way and not just seen in a, I see you, but I don't like what I see. And I think many times during the honeymoon phase, a big part of that is not only dopamine and all the good chemicals are firing and we make reckless choices, stay up too late, spend too much money, eat too much because we're just so enamored in this season, but you're also reinforcing that season through all the time that I'm seeing and knowing and asking questions and being being asked questions and then feeling like, oh my gosh, I've never even thought about that before. And seeing it through the eyes, the mirror neurons of watching somebody delight in me as they talk about me, you're talking about like mega wonderfulness is happening inside the body and the soul. But over time we get very busy, we get very distracted and the brain habituates, which just means I already know that. And so I stop asking the question and I fill in your end of your sentence because I already know what you're going to say. And I stop really listening with my heart and I'm just taking in information as facts and knowledge, but there's, uh, the Bible says knowledge puffs up while love builds up and we have to be mindful. Am I still living a life of love to build up? Or am I using my time with that person to just get a transmission of facts and knowledge? Is that a time where we're just seeing what's the logistics, who are taking the kids, the mortgage, what's going on with these areas? Or is this an opportunity to say, hey, I recognize the way that you were winsome and delightful. And it just caused my heart to warm when I watched you care for that person or the way that you led that meeting, you were efficient, you were clear, you were concise, you were compelling. And it was inspiring and motivating to know that I get to be with someone who is such a fierce leader or such a kind and compassionate person who empathizes and sees the person who's on the outside and you draw them in. That is so attractive. And I delight in that about you. If we would create that culture, I think we would drive drastically see the divorce rate go down because you're living with the biggest cheerleader. 
the person that does see all our quirks and our growth areas, but is also the same person that wants to call out and motivate and encourage us to grow and lean in those things that are our God destiny inside. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well said. (laughs) <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much for being guests today. This is a huge privilege. And again, the book is called Strength Based Marriage. And the website is strengthsmarriage.com. And you can get the book all over. I use it with couples all the time. And it's just a great resource to have. You want to take the test, Strength Strengths Strength Finder. <laughs> 2.0. And you can do that online. We love you guys. Thank you for joining us for this episode. And for those who subscribe to the newsletter, you're going to get an extra bonus with Alan and Stephanie Kelsey. So be sure to subscribe and we want to see you at the next one. Bye. Hey, thanks so much for watching this episode of Unlock You. It is our dream to invest in you. And one of the ways you can do that is by getting more of the bonus material, the content, and to know about future events. Head to the website, drshannoncrawford.com, subscribe to the newsletter, and you'll be the first to know what we're rolling out. And we want you to truly get unlocked so that you can thrive, not only for yourself, but also for the greater calling on your life. Let's link arms and do it together. See you in the next episode.